Hi, how you doing today? We're in Psalm 119. We're going to be in verses 65 to 72 as we continue our trek through the word together, okay? Uh, I was just thinking, before I even start reading the verses and talking about them, I was just thinking, as I'd been pondering these a few minutes before I started the study here, was that everything in life, everything worthwhile in life, costs something. Whether it's stuff, time, commitment, I mean, it's going to cost something. Whether it's going to cost some money or some time or some commitment or service or payment by some other, some other way. And the same is true with Christian growth. Same is true with Christian maturity. Same is true with, with, with godliness. We're very quick to say at times, you know, that we, we want to grow as believers we want to be everything that God wants us to be, and, and we really do. We want to mature, and we want to become more Christ-like. But do we truly understand? Do I truly understand when I, when I say that, you know, what that requires? There's some vital, vital spiritual lessons that can only be learned through suffering. I know we don't like to hear that, but it's it's so true. If it's true that Christ, the Father's perfect Son, learned obedience through suffering. How much more is it true for us as sinful human beings? Read Hebrews 5 8. Well, the author of Psalm 119 was passing through a very painful furnace, a raging fire of affliction, was what was around him when God's spirit inspired him to write this marvelous song. Remember the, the Psalms are songs, man. And because of this psalmist's faithfulness to God's word, and he was suffering fierce, horrendous persecution from his neighbors, as well as from the officials of the land in which he lived. He picked that up in the various verses. In this division of Psalm 119, he declared gratitude. Can you, can you hear that? He declared gratitude for suffering, for his suffering. By recognizing what God had done through affliction, he confessed that the affliction was not only okay, but it was good for him. And God was good in allowing it to enter his life. Let's pick it up at verse 5 and read some of these things, all right? Verse 65. You have dwelt well with your servant, O Lord, according to your word. So the psalmist glorifies God. Even though he was bent low by the crushing burden of persecution, he was under tremendous persecution. We've seen that. He thanked the Lord for fulfilling the promises of, of his word. You have dealt well with your servant, O oh Lord, according to your word. He declared gratefully that the Lord had, had dealt well, you know, d done good with him, had performed or accomplished good in his, in, in, in his life. And the psalmist was, was able to see beyond, you know, his painful mistreatment to the wonderful work God had performed in him through suffering. And it's something we have to learn, man. Verse 66. Teach me good judgment and knowledge, for I believe your commandments. The psalmist didn't want to miss a single thing. <laughs> he didn't want to miss any additional work that God might, might do through his affliction. So what does he do? He asked God, he asked the Lord to continue teaching me knowledge. Continue to teach me good judgment. So he went on to confess that he had, he had believed God's commandments. That is, he had trusted and followed what God had taught him in, in his word. And in making this statement, he implied that he would continue to follow all that the Lord would teach him. Let's listen to, to it again. Verse 66, teach me good judgment and knowledge for what? I believe your commandments. Verse 67 before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. 
the fires of, of persecution, you know, had, had purified um, just the soul of this godly man. Through his affliction, God had done a marvelous work in his life. God had used the psalmist suffering to cleanse him of any remaining sin in his heart. Earlier in Psalm 119, the psalmist, dealt, the psalmist dealt with his tendency toward covetousness. He confessed his affection for things of no eternal value and asked God, was it, remember the question? He asked God this, he said, ignite in me new life. Please ignite in me new life. He wanted his life in his spirit Verses 35 through 38. Now notice something very critical here, very crucial in the process of the psalmist going through some times of purification. God did not cause his servant to be persecuted. He did not bring about the psalmist's mistreatment as a means of discipline for his sinful heart. However, he used the affliction to produce holiness in this child of his who was tormented by all that was going on in, in, in his life. And what God did is he worked through the suffering to accomplish his, his divine purpose for his child. And so what did God do? He brought good from the evil that men had intended against his child. Think about this. Verse 65, you have dealt well with your servant, O Lord. What a wonderful and a powerful statement. I'm going to go back to that verse for a minute. Um, the psalmist didn't say, Lord, you've been unfair to me. Or Lord, you have dealt so harshly with me. Or, Lord, why are you doing this to me? To the contrary, he recognized the good things God had done for him through his suffering by focusing on God's faithfulness to his word. And what happened through that was this dedicated the psalmist, this disciple, and he was able to say that the worst ordeal of his life had been good for him. Look at verse 71. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, that I may learn your statutes. When we are entangled in a painful trial, and they happen, or we're the target of persecution because of the world we live in, we need to be aware of what God wants. What he wants is to work in our lives through what's going on. We should open up our hearts to God, submitting ourselves to whatever he wants to do in our lives when we're able to recognize God's gracious hand at work. And when we can recognize that, we'll be able to rejoice in our trials. And I'm just not blowing wind here. I, I, I'm not just speaking, you know, off, off the cuff, hoping this will work. I've been in those trials and I'm going through one right now that's really, really tough. I mentioned some things about it yesterday with my family and some diseases my daughters are going through and they're you know the and and um they've they've got the covid disease and and they're in trouble breathing and and getting over it and you know it's it's a rough time but when we step back and say okay god you're gracious and you're always gracious you're always merciful you only do gracious and merciful things. So when I realize that, when whatever's going on in my life and the life of those that I love and and uh, pray for them, I, 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 I pray with an understanding that we can rejoice in our trials. I know rejoice in my daughter's pains or the, the inability to, to breathe properly right now and, and all of that, of course, and I'm praying for God to to set them free. But what God wants to show us is that we will emerge from the furnace of affliction, and my girls will too, 
more godly than when we went into that affliction. And he promises that. James 1, 2 to 4, Romans 5, 3 to 5. Read that for yourself later. That's what God promises. Look at verse 68. You are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Verse 67, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I keep your word. Then you are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. So we have the, the psalmist here. Confess his faith in the holy character of the Lord. Even though he was suffering intense persecution, he reemphasized the fact that God is good and that everything he does is good. Notice again, he doesn't blame God. He doesn't question God. He doesn't doubt God. Experiencing God's goodness through his affliction actually, for the psalmist, reinforce the fact that God has a purpose for everything he permits to enter our lives. Every affliction, every challenge, and every trial, even persecution, is an, is an opportunity for God to reveal his goodness to us. We don't always see that. We want to get out of this hurt. We want to get out of this pain. We don't want to be persecuted, even for righteousness sake, because it hurts, it's not good, it's bad, and, and on and on and on. And I don't like the trials, and I don't like to get down in the pit. I don't like to be there, but yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you're with me. Your rod, your staff, they comfort me. You anoint my head with oil, and on and on and on. And it's just so important for us to understand that God is always with us. So it's not me trying to bring him down and get his attention. He knows what's going on. That's what the psalmist said. In my pain, you're there. And when we understand that God is working in our lives, doing what he does, and that's good things and always is. Pick it up verse 69. The proud have forged a lie against me but I will keep your precepts with my whole heart. Verse 70, their heart is as fat as grease, but I delight in your law. Well, the psalmist, whether it was David or Ezra, you know, sometimes I just like to think it's David because I, we know so much about his life, but Ezra's pretty exciting too. The psalmist proud or, or arrogant, you know, the proud have forged a lie against me. So that's, that's what he's saying. Um, so his proud, arrogant persecutors, persecutors uh, they're wicked people who smugly ignored God's laws. Verse 69 says they were telling vicious lies about this man. He described their evil, corrupt hearts as being fat as grease. What in the world does that mean? Hard callous and insensitive. Still, he de this, this devoted psalmist refused, it's not going to happen, he refused to allow his tormentors their cold-hearted ways to affect him and his faith in God. In spite of their efforts to destroy him, he continued to delight in God's law. We just saw that. And, well, we'll see that in, in, in verse 70 again. I, I read a little while ago. He longed for God to teach him his word because he needed to know God's commandments and to hold to them even when being per, 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 persecuted. Sorry, start stuttering there. Let me just kind of run around with this for a little bit, all right? Um, we need to be like this psalmist where we surrender and we have teachable spirits. We need to see every trial. Okay, God, I want, to be, I want to be teachable here. I want you to teach me the things that you desire that I know. I want you to teach me things about you. I want to give you this opportunity to change me, change my heart, oh God, change my life. Reveal to me what you want me to know. 
God, in every difficult situation that, that I go through, in, in every situation that I face, please, God, teach me lessons that will strengthen me, that will mature me, that will make me more like you. That needs to be our prayer, needs to be our desire. When that thing hits us, instead of us just backing up and saying, oh God, I almost went over in the chair. Oh God, what am I supposed to do? Oh God, this is a big one. And we can pray like that and we feel like that at times, but we still need to look and say, what, what in this? Maybe you didn't cause this, God, and you don't cause all the pain. You don't cause all the, the, the discomfort. You don't cause all the persecution. I know that, but you allow it at times. And as we're going through things, you're there. And we have to know that you're there. <laughs> what for? To transform us into the image of his son, Jesus Christ. Be not conformed to the world, but be, tr be being transformed by the renewing of your spirit. So we, we need to understand that in that, that thing that we're going through, we can never allow ourselves to be so, and I've done it so many times, so I'm talking to me probably at the head of the class here. Please listen, Chuck, okay? I don't want to allow myself to be so consumed or so overwhelmed by the circumstances that I miss the valuable lessons God wants to teach me through these lessons I'm going through. And I don't want to miss that. Isn't that your prayer too? I know it's hard. I know it's tough. And as I'm praying for my for my daughters in their situation, you know, laying in the hospital for the for, for day after day after day and, and one that one of them has gone home on oxygen and one of them is still in the hospital, you know, fighting for breath and and um I pray for her constantly, of course. But my prayer is I want to view this through spiritual eyes to reaffirm the great value that anything that happens in our lives, you work out for our good, that you cause everything to work out for good. You cause all things to work together for good to them that love him and are called according to your purpose. So what the psalmist did is he declared gratefully that his affliction had been good for him. Now, that's not always, we're not always able to do that in the midst of that affliction. Sometimes it is so painful and so scary and so overwhelming that we don't know what to do. And I'm not sitting here saying that when that happens in my life, I just go, go for it, God. Show me what you want me to learn. No, I'm praying. I'm, I'm, I'm weeping. I'm, I'm hurting. And, but in the midst of that, I'm, I'm able at times to say, but God, show me what you want me to know. Show me who you want me to become. Teach me whatever lessons I need to know. God, you know. The psalmists had learned. Suffering had taught him how precious God's word truly is. God's word is more valuable than immeasurable wealth in silver and gold. It is good for me that I have been afflicted, verse 71, that I may learn your statutes. The law of your mouth is better to me than thousands of coins of gold and silver. So in the end, the psalmist's pain gave him far more in scripture than it cost him in affliction. As the author of Hebrews stated, which I think is Paul, but there's nothing pleasant about God's bliss discipline while we're going through it, like I was just saying, Hebrews 12, 11. The same is true of persecution or sickness or poverty or uh, whatever, whatever the case we're not able to see what God is producing in us through our trials most of the time and until they're over. But here's the deal. When we persevere in, our, persevere in our struggles and look for God's hand in them, we will eventually understand the Lord is compassionate and merciful, James 5.11. Like the psalmist, we'll be able to say one day, 
that it is good for us to be afflicted. I can't maybe say that today for my daughters or for myself in that situation. But like Job, we will at some point learn wonderful things we never knew before as we're being transformed into the image of Jesus. Even more precious, we all have come to know God in a greater and a deeper, deeper way. And that's, that's our goal. That's our desire. That's our hope, isn't it, for, for each of us? I hope you're able to see that as we're going through this. And I'm, I'm not trying to minimize what anybody's going through. I know the pain is deep. I know the hurts are real. I know when a loved one is suffering or when you're suffering or when there's you're going through grief because it's been a loss of of somebody or you've gotten on the phone that did what this particular you know disease is 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 doing in your body and and on and on and on I'm not minimizing that, but I'm saying that at some point as we persevere and we persevere sometimes on our knees more than we do on our feet. There are some times when it just in, in you know, I, I just feel like turning off all the lights in my house and just sitting in my chair and just meditating on the Lord and praising him and worshiping him and thanking him and beseeching him for the things that are going on. And I do that. And I don't say this is so joyful and I'm so glad that my, my kids are going through. I'm so glad I'm in pain. I'm so glad I don't do that. I say, God, I'm going through this valley, but I, th I thank you that you're with me. And I, I know that I can trust your word. I can trust your precepts and your, your promises because you're God. And I guess I just want to see a glimpse. Tell us that, that as we persevere, we will see change in our lives. There's, maybe you're a little more tolerant now than you were before that started. Maybe you're a little more compassion towards somebody else than you were before you went through this thing. Maybe you're a little more faithful to the things of God now that you're on the other side. I don't know. All I know is what God's word says. And there'll be a time where we're rejoicing. And I know that the preparation we go through here is not just for, for this, this life, but there's a better one coming on. There's gonna be a day when we as believers will be caught up together with those who have gone before us. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. It's going to be such a party, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Oh, can't even begin to comprehend what that's going to be like. Down here on earth, it's going to be some, some pretty tough times for those that are still here, for those that weren't part of his family. And we're not going to be part of that. And at the end of that, Jesus is coming back to set the record straight. And the Bible says, we're coming back with him. Then he's going to set up his kingdom here on this planet for a millennium, a thousand years. Show us what it was supposed to be like in the first place. And then he destroys the earth and the heavens and creates a brand new one for us, for our eternity, for what he's created for us. And my mind can begin to just fade out as I begin to think of God continuing to create throughout all eternity. When I look at this creation that he spoke into existence in six days. So we have a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful eternity in front of us. Anyway, I'm glad you're with me today. God bless you. Keep looking up. Jesus is the answer. He's with you in that trial. He's walking it through with you. One day, one day, you'll say, it was okay for the joy that was set before me. All right. Hey, God bless you. And we'll uh, see you tomorrow. And we'll pick it up at verse 73 and go down to verse 80. Okay. God bless you. See you tomorrow.